sorry. I'll try to send a reminder about the quiz Friday too, and I'll remind you during class. So I know it's the first quiz, so it's easy to forget. Um, yeah, okay, here we go. There, and I have the chat box open. So if you have questions, you can put it in the chat box or just speak up, that's fine. All right, so I always make post-its to myself and of course it's at school and I don't have it as to where we finished, but I think we went over this slide. Is that correct? You guys, this looks familiar. I think we went over the valence shells and electrons. Um, so I'm going over a similar topic in my, okay, thank you, in my AMP class. And I just did that today. So I'm a little thrown off. Okay, so we'll start here and I'll just remind you of, what the take home message was here. So there's these electrons um, in the outer shell of these atoms and the atoms want a full outer shell, which generally means for everything other than hydrogen, they want eight electrons. That's why we call, um, we, I mentioned the octet rule. So octet refers to eight. They want eight electrons in their outermost energy level. Hydrogen, it only needs two. So it just needs one extra one. So this is what determines how atoms are going to bond to each other. They want to match up with other atoms that can share or give them um, those extra electrons to fill up their outer shell. So I think I ended there. I don't think I even brought up the periodic table. Um, so if I did, apologies, but I'm just going to repeat this. So um, if we look at the periodic table, um, you can figure out how many valence electrons any given element has, and then you can determine what it's likely to bond with. So we don't need to know much of many of the elements on here. So I'm going to black out the whole middle. We don't care about the middle <laughs> and even the bottom. We could, I could black out the bottom here, these two rows. The vast majority of the periodic table we're not dealing with. Um, I wanted to show you the periodic table because I wanted to show you it's organized in a very specific way. And one of the useful parts of that organization is figuring out how many valence electrons there are for each of these atoms. So over here on the left with hydrogen, so you'll see hydrogen a ton. We're going to talk a lot about hydrogen. It's that very first element. It only has one little electron. It just needs one more to fill its outer shell, which is just the first energy shell. Um, this number here, it's, um, that's a Roman, Roman numeral one and then A, you can see the A, so it's not an IA, it's a one A. That one indicates that this whole column here only has one valence electron. Here um, with the two A, this whole column only has two valence electrons. Um, so going back to this one column, Hydrogen is the only weird one where um, it only has, it only needs one more electron. If we go down to lithium or sodium, they only have one valence electron, but we're out a little further now. So they have more than just one electron to begin with, um, but they only have one in their outermost shell. So sodium has, I think, three energy shells. So it only has one in its outermost shell. Um, it's really hard to, it, and it wants eight. So it's gonna be really hard for sodium to get seven more electrons. So what sodium will likely do is give away that one electron in this valence shell and just say, here, take that one electron and then that energy shell will basically disappear. And the next one down is now the outermost one and it's full. So um, the elements over here typically are gonna donate their electrons because they, it would take a lot more effort to get seven more electrons versus just getting rid of one. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. Um, so we'll see sodium again, really just over here, I'll probably just be talking about hydrogen and sodium. So if you want to circle those, those are two you want to be kind of familiar with. Okay. I need to minimize some of this stuff so I can see my slide. Um, if we go over to the other side of the periodic table, here we have the, um, the Roman numeral seven, seven A. That means this whole column has seven 
valence electrons. So it only needs, they only need one more. So they are highly reactive. Fluorine is very, very reactive. We won't really talk about fluorine. I'll mention uh, chlorine some, um, cause sodium and chlorine together make table salt and ACL. Um, so these are really highly reactive. If they can grab one more valence, one more electron they have a full outer shell. Oxygen, you wanna circle that one. That's a really important element that we'll be talking about. It's Roman numeral here is six. That means it has six valence electrons, which means it needs two more. Nitrogen, five, that's the V. Carbon, four, the IV. So um, circle the C, N, and O. We're gonna be talking about those a good bit. Um, know how many valence electrons each of those has. And then chlorine. The only time we'll be talking about that really is in relation to sodium. So you wanna circle sodium as well. And then hydrogen. That's really the elements that I'm gonna be focusing on um, by and large when we're talking about some of this bonding. We'll see others obviously like phosphorus will come into play, but um, those are the main ones when I'm talking about this bonding action. Okay, so um, that's really all you need to know about the periodic table of elements for our purposes. There's a ton of information in this periodic table, but you don't really, at least for the biology side of things, you don't need to know any more than that. Just be able to predict based on what column an element is in, how many valence electrons it has, because that'll tell you what it's going to bond with or how likely it is to bond. Any questions about that? All right. So now that you know the basics of sort of how atoms are set up and a little bit about why they bond and what sort of forces them to bond, we're gonna talk specifically about moving from those atoms into molecules. So molecules are just a bunch of atoms or at least, at least two atoms bonded together. It doesn't have to be a bunch. So more than one atom, if you have more than one atom bonded together, that's gonna to be a molecule. And this chemical bonding is basically what makes, I've said this a million times already in this class, I think, um, it's what makes life possible. So if atoms never bonded with each other, we wouldn't have life. These atoms bonding together allow for functionality that atoms on their own don't have. So that goes back to that emergent properties theme that we talked about. Molecules are more complicated. They can do a lot more than their atoms would just on their own if they weren't bonded. So that's where we're going now. We're gonna talk about the main types of chemical bonds. So yeah, that title of this slide basically says um, in fewer words what I just said, life relies on chemical bonds to make higher order molecules from atoms. Those molecules can do a lot more than their atoms can on their own. Okay, there's four types of chemical bonds um, and I've listed them in order from the strongest bond to the weakest um, from a biological perspective. So we have, and I'm gonna go through each of these um, and sort of the details of what they are. We have covalent bonds, hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, and van der Waals forces. Um, so covalent bonds are what we'll spend most of the time on. Um, they are the strongest and probably the most prevalent amongst um, the biologically important molecules. And hydrogen bonds are really important too. They're a little bit simpler. Okay, so I'm gonna run through each of these one by one. First, starting with the covalent bond. Covalent just means the sharing of valence electrons by two atoms. So um, one atom doesn't take an electron from the other, they just happily share with each other. So if we look at hydrogen, this is sort of the simplest example. H2, um, two H's together is hydrogen gas. Um, so we know hydrogen only has one valence electron, so it only needs one more. So when two hydrogen atoms come together, you can see here by this, um, simple dot structure or this sort of um, more diagrammatic example here. One of the hydrogens will be shared with um, each of the 
hydrogen atom. So each of them has one and they share the other one with the other hydrogen. So now they each have two and they're sharing both of them. So that means both of their valence shells are, which is just the first shell, both their valence shells are full. That means they're happy. So they're good to go. Hydrogen gas is very stable. <clears throat> it won't react with much. Same idea with oxygen gas, O2. So two oxygen atoms coming together makes oxygen gas, what we survive on. Um, so they will share two of their valence, two of their electrons that are in the outermost shell with each other. So oxygen has six already. Each of these oxygen atoms has six and they'll each share two with the other one. So now they each have eight in their outermost shell. Um, water, I'll spend a lot of time on water um, in the last half of this chapter, this lecture chapter. Um, water is critically important for life. So we're gonna learn a lot about the properties of water, but when it bonds, so H2O is water. I think probably everyone knows that. So there's two H's and an oxygen, two hydrogens and an oxygen. Um, so those hydrogens each want one and the oxygen wants two. So Two of those hydrogens bonding to the oxygen means two more electrons are being added to the oxygen valence shell, which means it goes from six electrons to eight. So oxygen's happy. And then um, hydrogen also shares two of, or one of those electrons. Each hydrogen will share one of those electrons from the outer shell of oxygen. Um, so everyone benefits in a covalent bond. So all of the different um, atoms that are involved in a covalent bond benefit somehow. So that's H2O and then CH4, that's methane. Um, we won't talk a whole lot about methane, but um, this is just another example. Carbon has four valence electrons. So that means it needs four more, which means four hydrogens can provide, each can provide one. So uh, methane is pretty readily formed in nature. Okay, so that's covalent bonding. Um, there's a couple of subtypes of covalent bonds that are really important as well. So let's talk about those. Um, there's polar covalent bonds and nonpolar covalent bonds. And the difference between these two, they were, we're still dealing with sharing of electrons the difference is that um, in one, electrons are shared equally and one, electrons are shared unequally. So um, a polar covalent bond, the electrons are shared unequally. And I'll talk about what that means in just a minute. Nonpolar, the electrons are shared completely equally between the two, two or more atoms. So equal versus unequal sharing, that's the difference between polar and nonpolar. You definitely wanna learn this. This will come up over and over again, um, sort of throughout this whole semester. Whether a bond or a molecule is polar versus nonpolar will determine how it interacts with other molecules. So polar molecules, just to jump ahead a little bit, but polar molecules like to be around other polar molecules and nonpolar like to be around other nonpolar. So it is really important to know whether a molecule is polar or nonpolar. And back to the periodic table, um, polarity is determined by what we call electronegativity. And electronegativity, I've defined it here, it's just the attraction of an atom for the electrons of a covalent bond. So what does that mean? <laughs> Basically means that some atoms are greedier for electrons than others. They hold on to them a little bit closer. So if you imagine um, a molecule of um, two different atoms bonded together, if it's polar, one of those atoms is gonna sort of pull the electrons closer to it and hold the electrons a little bit tighter. It's greedy. And then the other one, the atom that's not as greedy is kind of, it's sort of a partial sort of partially positively charged because the electrons are closer in to the greedy atom. So if we look at, um, again, uh, using the periodic table, 
these different shades of purple indicate the amount of electronegativity. And you don't have to memorize these. <laughs> I'll tell you if one atom is more electronegative than another. So don't worry about this. But if you were to look at this, you would see fluorine. Where's my mouse? There we go. Fluorine, like I said, is a really highly reactive molecule and it's really electronegative. It is very greedy for electrons. It wants to hang on to them very close to it. Oxygen is also pretty greedy for electrons. So the darker the purple here, here's the shading, the higher the electronegativity. If an atom has high electronegativity, that means it's greedy for electrons. Um, on the other side, hydrogen isn't quite as greedy. Um, lithium, really not at all. Sodium, not at all. Um, so you can look at this shading of the periodic table and determine if you know the, the molecule and the elements in the, the atoms in the molecule, whether it's going to be polar or nonpolar. So we'll look at some examples of polar and nonpolar molecules in just a second. Okay, so electronegativity, it's a really important term that you wanna know the definition for and sort of be able to explain how it contributes to polarity of a molecule. All right, so these really highly electronegative, I'll just keep using oxygen as an example, highly electronegative um, atoms are gonna grab on, this is only in covalent bonds, grab on to um, the electrons that are being shared and pull them a little bit closer to them. So if we look at a couple of examples here, um, we have O2. So this is our oxygen gas molecule, what we breathe. Um, oxygen is nonpolar. So if you have two atoms, in this case, two oxygens, they have the exact same electronegativity. One can't pull on the electrons more strongly than another, right? So whenever you have two of the same atom, it's always gonna be nonpolar. They're gonna be equally shared. One's not pulling more strongly than another because they have the same electronegativity because they're the same atom. Water, on the other hand, is polar. So um, if we look back at this periodic table, I'm gonna go back one slide. Whoops, maybe, oh, oh, okay. So hydrogen is less electronegative, it's 2.20 than oxygen, which is 3.44. So oxygen is gonna grab onto the electrons, pull them in to it self a little bit closer. So it's gonna be greedier. So here we have the oxygen atom, that's the red ball here, and then the two hydrogens to make water. Um, the oxygen, because it has such high electronegativity, is pulling those electrons that are being shared between the hydrogen and the oxygen closer into it. And um, that's what creates this partial negativity. So that weird uh, Greek symbol there, <laughs> don't worry about it, but this negative is what you wanna focus on. That just means it's partially negative. Um, so the oxygen, because it has those negatively charged electrons in a little bit closer to it, is partially negative. And that leaves the hydrogens as partially positive. So you have a, a negative side of the molecule and then positive side of the molecule as well. That's um, the result of a polar covalent bond. So when it's polar, you have a negative side and a positive side. When it's nonpolar, there's no charges, it's neutral. Stop me if you have any questions, please. Okay. Polar, nonpolar, um, yeah. So now we're gonna move into another type of bond, the ionic bond. Um, so I should have done hydrogen bond next, sorry. Hydrogen bonds are the next strongest, but it um, doesn't really matter. So ionic bonds are not, we don't, they don't involve sharing of electrons. They are going to actually transfer electrons from one atom to another. So they're not happy go lucky sharers like the covalent bond atoms are they are actually transferring one electron or one or more electrons from one atom to another, total transfer. 
And this is going to create two different um, ions. So we call them ions for ionic bond. The cation is going to be positively charged. So that would be sodium. So we're here, we're looking at uh, um, sodium chloride, which is table salt, NaCl. That's table salt. The sodium atom, remember, it's in that first column of the periodic table. So in its outermost shell here, it only has one electron. So getting seven to fill that up is a lot of work. So what it does is it says, OK, I'm just going to donate this electron over to chlorine. Chlorine has seven electrons in its outermost shell. So it just needs one more. So it actually works out pretty well. That's why salt is such a common molecule. Um, so Na donates one of its electrons to chlorine. And um, the more electronegative atom, which makes sense, is going to be the one that gets the electron. It's going to pull the electron towards it. So these are the electronegativities from that uh, purple electronegativity periodic table I showed you. Sodium is not very electronegative. It's not very greedy for electrons. Chlorine is. So that electron will be transferred over to chlorine. That creates a cation and an anion. So the cation is the positively charged one. That's going to be sodium. Sodium is now positively charged because it lost one electron. So if you imagine in its natural state with all of its electrons, it's neutral, right? There is no charge on sodium if it has all of its normal, its normal set of electrons. If one of those electrons is taken away, electrons are negatively charged. So if some negative charge is taken away, it becomes positive, more positive than it was before. So Na becomes the cation, which is positively charged. So we put Na and then a little plus. And chlorine, because it um, added another electron. So it added more negative charge to itself by taking on this donated electron, becomes the anion, which is negative, the negatively charged ion. So Cl minus, so that's chloride. And you don't have to worry about the naming conventions how it goes from chlorine to chloride. But Cl minus, that means it took on another electron. OK, I think that's all I want to talk about with ionic bonds. Just remember, it's a total transfer of one or more electrons. NaCl is the most common that I'll probably, I'll use that example very often. OK, so we have the cation, we have the anion. Let's move on to hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds result because of polar covalent bonds. So they're closely related to the polar covalent bonds. And these are essentially where there's an attraction between, um, I shouldn't have, yeah, partially positive hydrogen atoms. So usually we're talking about this from the perspective of water. So we can think about this from the perspective of water. So we know that the hydrogen bonds in a water molecule are kind of positive, slightly positively charged, because oxygen is pulling those shared electrons in towards it, leaving hydrogen sort of positively charged. So that positive charge um, is then going to be attracted because positive charges are attracted to negative charges. Those positively charged hydrogens are going to be attracted to any negatively charged part of another covalent, covalently bonded molecule. Uh, this chat is getting in my way. OK. <laughs> um, so here we have um, ammonia, which is NH3. Uh, I don't expect you to know that. But the nitrogen here on ammonia is slightly negatively charged. It's kind of like oxygen pulling those electrons in closer to it. So it's negatively charged which means that positively charged hydrogen is going to be sort of attracted to that negatively charged nitrogen, which will bond these two molecules together. So that is a hydrogen bond. So it's always dealing, as the name entails, a hydrogen uh, atom. So as you might imagine, this other hydrogen atom can do the same thing. So there's two hydrogen atoms on each water. 
So this hydrogen atom can also be attracted to the negative part of another molecule, kind of like uh, maybe another NH3 um, or another water molecule. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So hydrogen bonds happen in a lot of different places. Um, we can have this intermolecular hydrogen bond, which just inter means between two different things and intra means within one molecule. So intermolecular would mean between two different molecules. Here we have water and ammonia. So that hydrogen attraction to the nitrogen here is gonna create ammonium hydroxide. That is found in a lot of different household cleaners. That's an intermolecular bond. These are two different molecules bonding together. A really important place that we have hydrogen bonds is in our DNA. So DNA has intramolecular hydrogen bonds. Intra means within. So we're within one molecule. So DNA, we'll get into this later in the semester, but DNA is one molecule. It's one really big complicated molecule um, that looks something like this. This is part of a DNA molecule, a small part. Um, and the two sides of the DNA molecule, you've probably seen the, the double helix of the DNA molecule. It's wrapped around itself. Um, so these two sides uh, basically kind of mirror each other. And those two sides are held together by these hydrogen bonds. So these dots indicate the hydrogen bonds. So hydrogen bonds are critical for keeping our DNA together. We like hydrogen bonds. <laughs> and they're also important when it comes to a lot of different properties of water that we'll get into. Okay, so those are the main, those are the three primary types of bonds. Um, there's uh, one more that I'll go over in here that isn't nearly as common, but it's kind of an interesting, uh, an interesting scenario but it's really weak. And these are Van der Waals interactions or Van der Waals forces. You'll see them listed as both interactions or forces, but Van der Waals. And these are weak temporary attractions basically between um, parts of nonpolar molecules. So now we're talking nonpolar. So I told you earlier that nonpolar molecules don't have a positive and negative side, right? They're sharing the electrons equally, like oxygen, O2. They're not, one of those atoms isn't pulling on the electrons more than another. So that's an oversimplification. <laughs> um, in fact, there's, we don't say there's a partial positive or negative charge on nonpolar molecules like O2. Um, but these nonpolar molecules still have sort of constantly fluctuating charges because electrons are spinning all around this electron cloud in these atoms at all times. So electrons are sort of constantly shifting, which is going to shift that charge to negative or positive. Um, you can't really predict when it's going to be negative or positive, or I guess you could if you're like a physicist and deal with all of that. But it's sort of, um, we'll consider it sort of random, how they, how the electrons fluctuate around the atom. So you have these electrons kind of fluctuating all around. Sometimes they might be over by, you know, one oxygen molecule, making that one oxygen molecule a little bit more negative. And then they might switch over to the other oxygen molecule, making that a little bit more negative. So there's this kind of constant fluctuation um, within even nonpolar molecules, just because of the motion of these electrons. So <laughs> that constant shifting, and I put here ever-changing positively and negatively charged uh, regions, is what ca causes van der Waals interactions. So again, positive and negative charges are attracted to one another. So if one atom is slightly positively charged, at, at uh, an instant in time, that atom will then be attracted to something that's positively charged at that instant in time. And then it'll change in the next instant. So they're kind of constantly shifting. That I know sounds really confusing, uh, but I think um, an example might help, maybe not help explain the physics of it, but at least help <laughs> explain how this applies in biology.
Um, so here we have a little gecko. Um, if anyone's ever seen a gecko before, uh, he was likely, he or she, was likely maybe walking up a wall or maybe on the ceiling. Um, so geckos can basically defy gravity. They shouldn't be able to walk up a vertical flat surface because <laughs> they don't have anything to grip onto, right? Um, so essentially what their little toes do is they have a bunch of um, van der Waals interactions going on between these uh, really complex toes that I'll talk about in a minute and the wall that they're clinging to. Um, so the, uh, you can see here kind of a close up of their toes. It looks like there's a bunch of hairs and here's a microscopic version of what that looks like. So there's all these individual uh, projections. I don't know if they're technically hairs, but projections coming off of their toes. And uh, the cells, the atoms within those are constantly, uh, they're, they're experiencing that fluctuation. So it's nonpolar, but they're experiencing that fluctuation between positive and negative. So they're kind of constantly going positive, negative, positive, negative. And that is basically what attracts them and allows them to stick to the wall. And that instantaneous attraction will be gone the next second for one of these little projections. But then there's millions of other projections that still have that attraction or some have it and some don't. Um, so those van der Waals forces are essentially what allow geckos to, you know, do things that they shouldn't normally be able to do without van der Waals forces. So hopefully that helps put it in perspective a little bit. We won't talk about um, van der Waals interactions too much more in this class. We'll mostly focus on, like I said, covalent bonds and hydrogen bonds. So you want to be really familiar with those. Understand van der Waals. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about ionic bonds. So understand van der Waals and ionic bonds, but you really want to grasp the covalent polar and nonpolar idea, um, as well as hydrogen bonds. So make sure you understand those. And hopefully you kind of have an idea of what these van der Waals interactions are all about. Ah, yes, can I define hydrogen bonds? Yep, um, I'm gonna actually go back to that slide. So hydrogen bonds, whoops. Hydrogen bonds are essentially where hydrogen in a polar molecule here, I guess I could go back to the actual definition here. It's kind of wordy, but um, we're talking about a polar molecule here. So it's a polar covalent bond when we talk about a hydrogen bond. So this is a covalent bond, right, between the oxygen and the hydrogen. So that's covalent. The hydrogen bond occurs between the hydrogen and another atom or another molecule, well, another atom or molecule. And that is because this hydrogen in this instance is sort of positively charged. It's attracted to the slightly negatively charged atom in this other polar covalent molecule. So in order to understand hydrogen bonds, you really have to understand um, polar covalent bonds. And remember polar covalent bonds, we're talking about sharing of electrons. So with water, oxygen, this oxygen and hydrogen, they're sharing electrons between themselves, but oxygen is greedy. It's pulling those electrons towards it, making that kind of negative. That means that leaves hydrogen is sort of positive over here. It's a little positively charged. So that slightly positively charged hydrogen is gonna be attracted to some other molecule and the negative part of that molecule. So here we have um, ammonia. This could be another water molecule as well. So another oxygen of another water molecule that's also negative. That hydrogen is gonna be attracted to that. That positive hydrogen is attracted to that negative in this case, nitrogen. Does that help? Hopefully. Hydrogen bonds are a little difficult to grasp. They always involve hydrogen and that hydrogen is attracted to a partially negative atom in another molecule. <laughs> If you don't understand it right now, um, 
don't stress about it too much. Try to um, go back to this, look at it on your own and ask me um, questions either Friday or you can email me and I'll try to kind of refine that definition if you need a little bit, um, a slightly different explanation. But the take home here, positive hydrogens are attracted to negative other atoms. And that'll hold molecules together. All right, so Van der Waals, Van der Waals. Um, and then the last one, it's not really a bond, it's more of an interaction, but uh, these play a big part in biology, hydrophobic interactions. Um, so hydrophobic, if you break down the word, means fear of water. So a phobia is a fear of something, hydro is water. Um, so these are molecules that fear water. They don't wanna be around water. So a good example would be oil and water. So you understand, you already in your everyday life understand the idea of hydrophobic interactions. Um, the, uh, the technical definition would be something along the lines of what I have written here. The attraction between nonpolar, I gotta keep an eye on the time here, nonpolar molecules when water is present. So um, I think I have an image. <clears throat> yeah, so here we have oil and water. So these big oil droplets down here, that's a whole lot of nonpolar molecules stuck together. Oil is nonpolar. Oil and fat, um, those are nonpolar substances. <clears throat> Water is polar. So these nonpolar molecules will all kind of glob together as much as possible when they're introduced to water. That's a hydrophobic interaction. They're kind of trying to stay away from the water as much as possible. Uh, an example we'll talk about in a lot of detail in um, a couple weeks here is the cell, the membrane around all of our cells. So every cell in your body has a little membrane around it and it's actually um, partially hydrophobic. So most of the membrane is hydrophobic, which means water doesn't easily pass in and out of the cell. So what we have in this diagram, it's not super straightforward, sorry. Um, but this is uh, a model of a cell membrane. So out here, these red and gray little dots are water molecules. So those are the H2O, so two H's and an O just like the image, I not image, the diagram I showed you earlier. So this is water outside the cell. This is water inside the cell. So we have water in our cells. Um, there's very, uh, there's specialized proteins basically that allow water to move into or out of a cell. Um, all of this in between here is hydrophobic, which means it's gonna repel water. It's gonna keep water out as much as possible. And that allows our cells to maintain a very specific water balance. So hydrophobic interactions are really important in biological systems in any organism, since every organism is made of at least one cell. And we'll talk about, it's, they're called phospholipids. We'll get into plenty of detail about that, but for now, just know this is a hydrophobic region of this membrane around a cell. Okay, um, I think we are gonna stop there before I get into details of water. I think that's a good stopping point. So, yep, I'll see you guys. I'll email you, but probably online again on Friday. And um, I'll remind you about the quiz and we'll finish up this chemistry chapter on Friday as well. So any questions? If no questions, you can go ahead and leave and I'll see you guys remotely on Friday.